Okay, so yesterday I put out a video showing how the Z68D4 map was set up. I was reluctant to just hand out the code, but now that DICE has chosen the nuclear option and completely removed XP from custom modes again, there is no reason not to share all the source. So first, here are the mechanical steps of making a mode. We load up portal, click create new, portal default, start editing, remove the default map, add in tech center, and select the right spatial JSON. Head down to scripts, make a new script file, and copy the script contents in. I like to save at this stage. Uh, as you can see, the editor sometimes doesn't save your code, so we have to go and save again. Name and description. thumbnail, create, and publish. There's a reduced XP warning, which is now accurate. It was there over the weekend as well, but those are all the steps to create a full experience custom mode as they were working over the weekend. Um, but just to reiterate, they are not working anymore. Now we can go in game and launch our experience. As you can see, uh, clearly they don't give full XP anymore. I'm going to host locally this time, if they do reintroduce XP, uh, you'll want to not host locally to make sure that XP is working, but of course you can still test locally. There just won't be any XP gain available there. Loading times can take a little while on custom maps. It is building a nav mesh. Uh, if you restrict your combat boundary in closer, you can actually speed up that load time. I'm not sure if that load time only applies locally or when you're playing remotely too. But that should do it as far as getting the mode working. Um, I'm going to include a GitHub link in the description here as soon as YouTube decides that it trusts me enough to include URLs in my descriptions. Um, the files used in this, I'll show the exact uh, spatial JSON and TypeScript file names on screen. You should just be able to follow these steps, copy those exact files into Portal and have the same experience running. So now I'm going to take a minute to go over the script and the spatial JSON. The version I'm going to go over is the latest version I've been working on. It differs from the ones that were kind of used uh, very widely publicly in a couple of ways. Um, teams are limited to 32 players. I'm trying to do a thing now where um, the number of bots just fills up to the 64 player cap and reduces the number of bots on each team, um, depending on how many human players are on that team. And then we've got the bots lined up into two rows of 32 bots instead of one big long line of 64 bots. And then each row is assigned to a different team. So each team has 32 bots to smile at. And the server should never go above the 64 player plus bot capacity. You probably also noticed the button over there, which you can click to um, have the player hug himself and switch teams. You have to a hug the player to make them switch teams after you call switch team on that player. So it's a two in one button for that. Um, earlier, Ed tried to automatically hug the player and switch them to the other team immediately upon spawning, but I think that just led to having uh, one team where players couldn't spawn. That's pretty broken. So this is an attempt to fix that. Um, still allow players to switch between teams, and then the architecture change earlier would allow two teams of players to both use the server at the same time. The other notable change is this pillar in the air over here. Uh, there's two buttons you can click to move it up and down. Um, if you move it down, bots spawn more rapidly. If you move it up, bots spawn more slowly. Uh, this was put in here to kind of limit the rate at which bots are being spawned in. So people can have a less laggy experience if that is what they desire. For implementation details, it's probably easier to start with the concrete visual stuff. So let's hop over to Godot. Uh, we can see I have the TSCN file for uh, ZBS2 open here. Uh, that TSCN file is um, on the GitHub repo that's linked. The spatial JSON file is output from Godot, 
and the tscn is godot's native scene format so if you want to make a map you need to modify or copy a new tscn file do your edits there and then you export the json and the json is what you upload to the website looking around the scene here there are a couple details to note um, most of these maps when you open them up the first time they'll start out with a root node they'll start out with uh, two hq objects with spawn points underneath them You'll have a combat area, which is this bounding box out here, which defines the outer boundary of the combat area. Um, I've added the camera. The static stuff here is the terrain and all this. So all this orange and green are the static assets. The green is the terrain and the orange are the objects that the map comes with by default. Um, there's a few interaction points, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. A um, bunch of vehicle spawners. And we have uh, some one big construction pillar for the bot spawn rate signal, and then we have a couple smaller pillars hidden underneath the ground here, which mark the location of our first AI spawner in each row. Underneath that, we have a whole ton of AI spawners, um, which are all positioned with a static offset from the one behind it. There has got to be a better way to position 64 individual spawners. And then we've got a couple more interaction points down there. I'm looking around the scene, we can see here are our two HQs and spawn points. They're all lined up to look at our default starting position. There's our big signal pillar. Once again, one of the row pillars, the other row pillar, um, and then around here, all these little gray balls are vehicle spawners. Getting into the code, we have a few things to look at. We've got our core DBS class here, but before we get into that, I'm just going to go over the full file structure and hit a couple key points. So we've got DBS, which tracks kind of the overall state of where our spawners are and which bot is spawning from which spawner. Team players keeps track of which players are on each team. We can also mark a player for respawn and have that respawn picked up on a later tick to actually have it uh, completed. Got a little get bot limit here, which kind of just looks into our player counts to tell us how many bots we can currently have. Got a utility function here to handle resetting um, our two DBS instances. These were sp split out for the two rows, one for each team. And then our uh, humans, our bots, and our signal blocks. This is our first of our implemented event handlers from the API. If you see a method that looks like this, um, export function, and then on something, that means that the engine is going to call this function every time the game mode starts, or every time there's a global tick, or every time a player updates those kind of things. Okay, after game mode starts, we've got our code to update each of the instances. Here we get our spawn interval from the signal block. Um, each instance has a, a queue inside. If we have it set to spawn immediately, we drain the whole queue, that tick. Otherwise, we, we wait for the spawn interval to, to process our next spawn. On global, we update both of our DBS instances and the global tick count. Here's where we're converting the signal bots level to the interval at which we uh, are spawning bots. Here's the actual signal block implementation, utility class for displaying vectors and logging messages. Let's go up to the DBS instance and see what it's doing. Internally, it has a map of spawners. In Godot, when all the spawners were set up, each one was assigned an ID from 100 to 163. When we set up the two DBS instances, we are defining the start of our ID range and then the number of IDs that we're assigning. The next variable passed in is the object ID, which was assigned to the construction pillar that's underground, marking the spot of the first start of the row. I used to have hard-coded vectors in here, and that was kind of awful if you ever needed to update it. Now that single object for each row can just be positioned and we can dynamically find it. Now we've got the first spawner's position, the first spawner's ID for our offset. Then we go through all of our spawners. Um, this AI set unspawn on dead true. So instead of going into a man down state or having a death animation, I don't remember exactly what it does by default, but basically this makes it so as soon as the bot is hurt too much, it just disappears. The unspawn delay in seconds, make sure it disappears very quickly too. When that unspawn happens, the leave game function is invoked for the bot. And also as part of our initialization here, we are checking can spawn bot to check the current count of bots on this team versus the bot limit for this team, which as I said earlier, is based off of the number of players plus bots on that team. It's supposed to be 32 minus one. 
So there's a free slot for someone to join into, but that's kind of in progress and maybe not a hundred percent working yet. Uh, going down here, the spawn bot thing we've been talking about, and then we've got push spawn. Uh, this is called every time a player needs to be respawned. So we pass in a player ID because that's all we get. And then we've got our bot spawner assignments where we have a mapping of player IDs to spawner IDs. Show you how those get set up in a second. Assuming we find our spawner, we add its spawner ID in order in the queue. So uh, we want the spawners at the front of the row to always be triggered first so that the bots closest to the player are always the ones which are refreshed first. Looking down here, we have a trigger which uh, we can just call repeatedly from an external bit of code which says uh, if there is something in the queue and we have room to spawn a bot please do so here's our method for when we want to spawn everything instantly we just go through the entire queue in a while loop here's our function for looking up a particular spawner in our map and then spawning a soldier from it here's where we're calling assign bot to spawner externally we get the bot's team ID. We make sure that, that it's being assigned to the right DBS instance for that team. We get the bot's ID, we get the bot's position, and then we get the distance from the bot to the first spawner in our row. So we know the start of the row, we know the direction the row is going in, we know the distance between the elements in the row, and we know how many elements are in the row. So we know the whole length of the row. If we figure out how far from the front of the row this bot spawned at, we know which spawner it spawned from. So that's what this logic is doing, is it's figuring that math out every time a bot spawns, and then storing that information for later. So when we need to replace the bot, we can just call in with the bot's ID and we don't need an actual bot object to find the location of because that's not given to us in that API call. Uh, here we've got some fairly untested logic for despawning excess bots. You know, if you've already spawned 32 bots and then a player joins, you need to despawn one. This is the logic that should take care of that. Getting down to team players, this is just tracking how many players are on each team. Originally, I just needed a set of knowing which players were alive so I know which players to try to give ammo to. Um, but then when I wanted to do the team balancing, it became necessary to know how many players are on each team. So those sets moved into this class here. We talked about the bot limit, how that's calculated before. Here's the initialization. We kind of already talked about that. Game mode started, we talked about talked about spawn interval. If you don't know how a modulo operation works, say spawn interval is set to 30, then on the 30th tick, this will compute to zero. 60 mod 30, zero. 90 mod 30, zero. If it's an even multiple of it, it'll mod to zero. So it's just a way to check every nth tick, n being 30 in that case. Ongoing global, we're just calling our update instance functions, which is this right here. All we're doing is checking what spawn interval we want and then spawning one or more bots. Here's where the signal bots level is converted to a spawn rate. The signal block has a static object ID so we can get its location. Do, 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 do when we call set level on it, we figure out where its original position is. And then we take the level times the spacing and we move it relative to its original position up a certain amount. So we get a delta from its original position to where it should be. And then we move the object. Then we have some little utility functions here just to add in, add or decrement our current level. This is just for display purposes. On player died, I was talking about that earlier. I need to know which players are currently alive so we know who to give ammo to. So when a player uh, dies, we remove them. This function handles players despawning. When a player despawns, I need to know that they're not available anymore to give ammo to so they get removed here. On player leave game, similar logic. We don't want to be tracking a particular bot anymore. We don't want to have it associated to a spawner ID if, if it's gone. But here we're calling that push spawn method from earlier. So we've got a bot needs to be replaced. We got its player ID. We are calling into the DBS instance with a player ID, asking it if it has a spawner ID for that player ID that it set up when the player initially spawned. If it finds the right spawner, it adds the spawner ID to the queue. And then when update instance is ready to spawn another instance from that queue, it's spawn. If it's not a bot, it's a human. So so we need to remove bots and then also fill up with bot. Here is where we're handling the respawn mark. We've got a P tick, which is 15. So every half a second, we just try to give the player primary and secondary ammo. And then that tick is offset by the player's player ID. So not every player is checked on the same tick. Here's our on player deployed call. For every bot that spawns in, we want to turn its targeting off, its shooting off, set its health to one. Uh, we add it to our bot list if it's if it should be here we call into the DBS instance to assign it to the correct spawner. When a player spawns in, we add them to the human player list. We set their max health to 500. We try to clean up, clean up excess bots. Here we're handling some interaction. There's a couple buttons in the game. There's the one right on the curb to your right when you spawn in, which is just ending the game mode, making the current player the victor. There's another one hidden on a roof in a construction site, which is currently set up just to reset 
the DBS class without actually ending the game mode. Here's our handlers for the block moving up and down, and here's our player team switch logic. All right, so thanks for watching. Uh, hopefully some of that was interesting or useful to someone out there. Um, if you have any more questions about portal modding that I might be able to help with, please leave them below. Uh, and have a great day.